Self-coach athletes, in my experience, typically, it looks like a lactate curve. They either pull far right or far left. They either pull very far to that science side in order to have this certainty and this confidence that what they're doing is systematic and measured, or they go too far to the other side, which is it feels bad today, so I'm not going to do it, or it feels this, or it feels that, and only go by feel. That Trap from So 167. Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host Michael and on today's episode I'm joined by Susan Sotier who coaches with Breakthrough Performance Coaching, has a PhD in sports and exercise psychology and is an assistant professor at Springfield College. We discussed the importance of balancing the art and science of uh, coaching or endurance training in general, general if you're a self-coach athlete, and how leaning too heavily on one side of the art and science equation can be costly if you're after improved performance. A couple of examples of things we'll go into include how important individuality is and why research findings should never be generalized directly to the individual athlete without a good knowledge of the context of this particular athlete and why this is the reason that lab testing can be so beneficial in optimizing and individualizing an athlete's training when we apply both the art and the science of coaching to their training. And we also discuss how to read research papers the right way and conduct a critical analysis of findings within. Before we get into the interview, big thanks to Precision Hydration for sponsoring this episode. They make electrolyte products that help you perform when you're sweating and losing a lot of sodium through your sweat, which we do. And we are still in winter training in the Northern Hemisphere, in a lot of places anyway. So uh, the amount of sweat that you lose might actually be as high or higher than what it is when you go outdoors for a ride, for example. Uh, Riding especially indoors can be very, very sweaty affairs. And if you don't have a a strong and powerful fan, it's it's even worse. So if you want to really make sure that your performance doesn't suffer for uh, losing too much electrolyte in your workouts, then Precision Hydration with their electrolyte products and their free online sweat test to help you get your ideal electrolyte uh, prescription will help you get you through the last part of the winter training. Precision Hydration is now also available in New Zealand and Australia, and any listener can get their first box for free on precisionhydration.com with the promo code DATTRIATHLONSHOW, all one word, all caps. And just very quickly before we get into the interview, I just recently launched my Intermediate Ironman training plan, and it's available for a launch promo, a big discount until the 10th of February, I'll talk a bit more about that after the interview, but for now, let's dive into the interview with Susan Sotir. So, Susan, welcome to That Triathlon Show. How are you? I am very well. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure. And why don't we start with you telling us a little bit more about your background in in coaching and in the sport in general as an athlete and, and also your academic background? It, it's funny. It's a it's a fairly long story, if I'm honest. Um, I started racing triathlon in 1989. Um, I was a college swimmer and a former pro, or at the time a current pro, named Scott Tinley, who was kind of one of the legends of the sport, was in the town where I was in college. And he was swimming with us and swimming with our practice. And I got to talking to him. And he had so much passion for it. And he talked so much about the community that I was like, I got to do that. That sounds awesome. That would be so much fun. And so I started racing then. And at the same time, I was you know, on this college swim team and we had to do some type of fundraising. And the choices were early Saturday mornings, teaching swimming lessons to the children of the faculty or to coach master's athletes, adult athletes, Uh, twice a week at night. And being a good college student, I chose the at night. Um, And so I started coaching and racing 
it, it was coaching swimming and racing triathlon at the same time. And I kept coaching swimming and I kept coaching sport in general, even as I graduated from college and started a career as a teacher and then went back to graduate school round one and went back into a school system and continue teaching. I kept coaching. And there was a point in time where I was working full time and coaching swimming full time and something had to give. And I kind of looked at the two career paths and the coaching to me was the fun one, the one that had the most, the most different things to challenge me as well as having the most immediate impact on people. So I started coaching and for a long time, I was coaching a varsity high school boys team. Um, High school in the United States is about from ages 14 to 18 for the most part. So I was coaching 14 to 18 year old boys in their high school season. And I knew the science and I knew the, the, the physics of swimming. And I would have two guys that I knew were equally prepared for a race and they would get up on the blocks and one would just kill it. And the other one would fall apart. And kind of at that point, I realized that there was this whole aspect of sports psychology that I didn't understand enough about. And that, of course, logically leads to getting a PhD. Um, So it was a little bit later in life that I went into that academic scientific world. And uh, once I was there, I realized I loved asking questions and answering questions and the systematic nature of it. And I got asked to stay and I had the opportunity to be at the place where I got my doctorate, a place called Springfield College, a birthplace of basketball um, and, and just a place that its philosophy is spirit, mind and body, which has always been my philosophy. And I got to stay and work with graduate students and help them develop great questions and great ways of answering those questions and become better consumers of research so that when they went out into the field to be practicing sport-oriented professionals, they weren't hurting people or making bad decisions based on what was most popular or or most current. They're using evidence-based decision-making to drive their choices. And finally, in the last couple of years, I have also been practicing my coaching. And that never went away. Even when I went back to grad school, I uh, switched to coaching or going back to a master's team, adult athletes. And in that adult athlete setting, I had a lot of triathletes from novices through professional level triathletes that were working with us. And that was the point at which I realized I needed to understand more of the whole picture of triathlon and expanded my coaching education to seek that information. So, and when I was, oh, I'm sorry, uh, go ahead, so, please. So just to clarify, your, Long your, story. your doctorate like is, in, is in sports psychology. And, uh, and before is. that, you got, uh, did you get your, your bachelor's or your master's in, was it uh, exercise physiology before that, that you started? Uh, I went the traditional coaching route. My bachelor's degree is actually a dual degree in English and classics. I was a Latin teacher. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Uh, so, but so, so where did you, so where did, where did you get the, the physiology when you said with in that swim meet uh, or coaching those swimmers, those, those kids that, that you knew the, uh, the science, the physiology of swimming and you knew the physics of swimming, where did you get that? Was that just from, from educating yourself? That was educating myself at the time. Okay. Um, when I did go back to graduate school, I had to take more formal classes in exercise physiology. And, but before that it was, I mean, constant self-study and at what point which year are we talking about when you started to to coach triathletes as well uh that would be 2000 uh, 2002 is when i was working with the masters team and through 2012 and within that period of time went from learning about the sport to mastering the sport to eventually coaching my own athletes in the sport right okay yeah, so so I think this is very important to to hear your backstory. Uh, and by the way, sorry, I I cut you off there. So was there? No, no, it, it could keep going. Trust me, don't worry oh, okay. about it. Okay, <laughs> okay, uh, but it it sets the context for for this uh, discussion that we have today on balancing the art and the science, 
of uh, coaching mm-hmm. and of training for the self-coached athlete. So uh, because you have uh, you have been an athlete, you you are a coach and you have the background in a- the academic background. But uh, we need both both the art and the science uh, of uh, of the spe- of the spectrum of training and uh, and racing. Can you tell us why? What what's so important about having both of those? If you only have one but not the other, you you're not really valuing the athlete in front of you. Um, you need the science side. You need to be systematic. You need to collect data. You need to draw conclusions based on those data. And you need to have a mechanism to explain the changes that you see. You can't just say, oh, I think it's they're, they're getting better because of this. If, if you're applying stresses in order to increase aerobic capacity, you darn well better be seeing measurable changes in aerobic capacity. If you are, on the other hand, not seeing those changes, you need to be able to go down the problem solving process in a systematic way using both the objective information and the person's subjective contributions to figure out way off the rails so that you can change what you're doing. The art side of it, the art I would say is is the creative insight and the emotional impact of what you do. And even that isn't just chaos, that, that piece of it, that art without that presence, that connection, you don't have engagement from your athlete. And without that engagement, you're, you're not impacting the training process in as effective and elegant a way as you possibly can. Feeling your way through the dark is, is fine. And you might make some sort of great creative decision in that. But if you go into things intentionally and pull from both the human in front of you the imagination, creativity to apply what is known to that human, the outcomes are better. Do you think it's common to, to go uh, for, let's talk about the self-coached athlete, because I think that most of the listeners, after all, they, they are not coached. So is for, uh, for triathletes these days, is it common to go too far to one side or, or the other? Or is it just that uh, uh, both sides are, are mixed? Of course, they, they're not coaches themselves, most of them. But, but how, how do you see that balance playing out in, in self-coached athletes in particular? Self-coached athletes, in my experience, typically, it looks like a lactate curve. They either pull far right or far left. They either pull very far to that science side in order to have this certainty and this confidence that what they're doing is systematic and measured. Or they go too far to the other side, which is it feels bad today, so I'm not going to do it. Or it feels this or it feels that and only go by feel. The two pieces have to unite in some way. And then there's this third piece that you didn't touch on, which is perspective. When we only have our own experience and one way of looking at things, we sometimes forget that there's a whole other realm of possibilities to explain what it is that's happening. So from that self-coached athlete, you know, we're, we're all going to prefer one side or the other. We just are human. We, we have preferences. But find the challenge is finding a way to make sure you're maintaining a perspective that is lesser influenced by those biases. Yeah, yeah, and and I think that's uh, that's one uh, that that's a place where the coach comes in really. If you, if you are an athlete, because it's very difficult to stay objective, and and then having that outside perspective is is so important. But of course, then uh, for us coaches, it's important that we also. Uh, make sure that we maintain that uh, that balance and have both of, both of those in place. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, individuality and how in science, when we read research papers, a lot of the time it's easy to to look at results of some study and uh, and and we think that hey, this is this is good information. This is something that I can apply in my coaching. But uh, what is often not even reported is the individual differences in the response to training. And uh, so can you expand upon that and how that plays into having both the, the art and the science again? Because we can go wrong if we just apply averages from research to the individual athlete. I get to go all Dr. Soto here. This is excellent. Um, from, from when we look at a research paper, when we look at a published paper, what we're seeing is something that made it through a, a series of hoops or gates to be able to get there. 
So we already, from a human perspective, are more biased towards taking those results as, as more certain. What we need to remember when we look at research is everything is based on samples. Uh, The idea of being able to actually access an entire population is impossible. So we have to take samples from those samples. We gather data and we calculate averages. We calculate means. So we basically take this nice pool of, of, uh, you know, and I'll speak to research that involves humans. Um, We take this nice pool of people who are willing to volunteer which is the first level of bias and who are accessible to the researcher, which is the next level of bias. And we reduce them to a single value, an average. When we see change that impacts that group, that's great. And and that's exciting. And that's wonderful. But a P value change, a statistical change, when we see all those numbers and blah, 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 that probability value is just that it's a probability based on an average. So the likelihood that we capture one individual's response to a particular intervention is less, but it's better than nothing. So if we see those that research published, we need to understand what it is the people, the question that was being asked, how that question was asked, who was involved in the answering of that question and how much of a change or an effect did that intervention have? And then we have to take that information and interpret it in the context where we're working. If we look at most exercise physiology research in particular, it's done with college aged males who are either untrained or recreationally trained. And that looks real different than most of the athletes who are competing in triathlon who have an average age that is much higher with different experience levels, different stress levels, and are involved in something for a much longer term than most research projects are. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Can you talk a little bit more about how to recognize potential flaws in uh, when we interpret research because a lot of listeners will go and actually read research papers i I know that from a lot of interactions with them so so how do you recognize those flaws or or biases in addition to the things that you already mentioned i love that your listeners read research papers that actually makes me really happy Um, the first place you start is the title what's the title of the paper because that title tells you an awful lot about how that researcher was viewing a question or how that group of researchers was viewing a question. And once you take in that title, you want to take a look at the introduction. A good introduction, bless their hearts, should be well written, which is always a challenge in research writing, but it should also include a a few certain things. There should be a mechanism of action or a theoretical foundation. There should be a way to explain any changes that occur through a known lens, one that's accepted and established. You can't just start asking questions and getting answers and thinking you can explain them unless you know what the process is that you're looking at and intending to impact, which is a lot like coaching. Once you understand how they are looking at this question, you want to see what other answers they've gotten in the past. That that introduction is a, a gold mine of information. It tells you what they looked at before to inform their question and, and what they valued as they were doing it. Looking at what's in there is just as important as maybe taking a look at some other papers to see what other researchers included instead. How people select what they put in that first part of the paper, it it informs how they ask their question and how they gather their information. Once you get to that methodology section, this this is kind of the place, actually, before you even get to the methodology, you should take a look at the couple of sentences right before it. Because in those last couple sentences of the introduction, There should be a clearly stated purpose of the study and the researcher's hypothesis of what they anticipated or expected to happen based on the history, the past literature, their experiences. The method should reflect the purpose and it should be clear and elegant. And 
the sample that they selected, there should be a, a process that tells you how they selected the, those individuals. Where'd they get them from? What do they look like? How many of them were there? What type of experiences did they have? Um, my biggest argument with the untrained athlete is that I can take them for a walk and give them an ice cream cone and they're going to change in some way just because they got some attention and having people or, or a group that you can generalize the findings to more directly is, is a better group than someone like elite athletes. You know, you want something in between if you're a self-coach recreational athlete, because what applies to elites doesn't necessarily apply to us. What applies to the untrained person doesn't necessarily apply to us. What do you think is closest? If um, if if there is one phenomenon that uh, two groups have investigated and uh, one of the studies had elite athletes as uh, their subjects and the other had uh, recreational athletes or, or untrained Uh, untrained recreational people what's the closest to the to the average intermediate age grouper well big silent pause here because i am i I don't have an answer it's one is so far away and the other is typically so far higher and with different genetic gifts that that's where the art and the interpretation and the context has to come in. And you have to look at what happened and how much of an impact it had on the untrained person. Then you have to look at what happened and how much of an impact it had on that elite athlete. And then you have to make a decision. Is it appropriate for the athlete in front of you or the athlete that you are? And more often than not doing what the elite athletes did from a physiology standpoint, different things happen. It can frequently hurt you because it's, it's too much of a load or too much of a stress for you to adapt to in your, your real world environment. But that untrained person, you know, again, is it better than what you've been doing? Is it different than what you've been doing? Is it more appropriate for your race goals? Then you have to do a a systematic trial and and make yourself a, a sample size of one and do a little bit of testing. But the the first thing that comes to mind is, is it has to fit with your race goals and it has to fit with where you are currently, not where you want to be or where you hope to be, but where are you? Mm, got it. So uh, sorry, I uh, cut in there again. You were at the methodology section talking about the, the subject. So, so if you proceed from there in how to interpret the, the research papers. Oh, the, so with that methodology section, how the subjects are selected, where they came from, what the inclusion criteria or what included them, what, what made it possible to include them in the study, those things are really important because that impacts, you know, who we are actually looking at. And then how did they actually conduct the experiment? Are there are there clear procedures that were are published and, and included there? If you have a question reading it, like I don't I don't know what happened in there, well then then you gotta wonder what happened in there because if it happened, it should be included and it should be clear and concise and replicable, repeatable by anybody else reading that paper. And when it's not, questions already have to start popping into your head about well, why aren't they telling us what they did? Why aren't they telling us what time of day? Why aren't they telling us what they fed them beforehand? That those pieces influence any type of findings that you have because it all of that influences how many how much control they have within that environment. An experiment in a laboratory setting should have high levels of control because you want to make sure what it is you measure and any changes that you actually identify are the result of the intervention. And if you can't see that clear process that we did this and this changed and it supports the mechanism, then you have to start thinking about what are the other factors that could have had an influence as well. And then how did they actually measure stuff? Were the measures valid? Were they measuring what they claimed to be measuring? Um, Were they reliable, consistent? Could they measure that same thing over and over again? Did they measure that same thing over and over again? One measurement taken at one point in time is a snapshot. 
and and doesn't create as clear a picture as measurements taken over the course of time. One measurement you know, taken from one group of people compared to a measurement taken against another group of people tells you less about differences than a baseline or a pretest measure, some measure taken during the course of the intervention, and then a measure later in the same people. I, I love repeated measures designs. I think that they are really important pieces to have because you can actually get to see how someone, how that process changed. And then how did they actually analyze that information, the statistics section, the part that everybody skips over, but is actually one of the most important parts of a paper. Um, that statistics section tells you what they actually compared and what they're actually trying to do with it. You know, were they looking for differences or were they looking for relationships? What were the values that were actually put into that? that those things matter to us because an, a, a mean change that didn't show a statistical difference might still be a really meaningful change in terms of its practical significance, how it impacts somebody's performance in a daily, in a daily way. Um, the example I used to use in my class was uh, Ironman Chattanooga, the first year that they ran that. The um, first and second place positions were a difference of less than eight seconds. And those are elite athletes, professional athletes. These people, it's their job. There is never going to be a statistical finding that is sensitive enough to find a difference that is worth eight seconds over an eight hour race. So practical significance takes on very different meanings as well. Um, so what kind of gain, what, what's the minimally clinically interesting difference, I guess, from there? Yeah, you still yeah, want me yeah, to keep yeah. going yeah. here, Michael? We're waiting for the, for, for the results, <laughs> <Okay>. I guess. <laughs> the results section is how do people interpret the statistics? Um, or the discussion section is how do people in, uh, interpret the statistics? If there was no p-value difference or no statistically significant difference, and the conclusion section starts talking about how one group was better than the other, and I say that because it happens an awful lot, they better have some type of metric that talks about what that difference was. And it, if percent change can be an impact of that, effect size can be an impact of that or an, an explanation of that. But the, that conclusion section had better, number one, reflect the statistical findings. Number two, reflect what was actually measured and then propose an explanation of the change through the lens of that theoretical foundation, that theory or that scientific mechanism that they started with at the beginning. It, it's, it should close the door on what they started in the introduction and everything in between should be of a, a repeatable quality, a high level of validity and, and reliability. And then the context has to be yours to interpret because a laboratory study ain't always going to go out and work in the real world either. So a couple of follow-ups on this first with, uh, in terms of the, the outcome yes. metrics that are measured, uh, a lot of studies will have uh, performance measures, but some will only have physiological markers of performance like mm -hmm. VO2 max changes and the likes. And uh, in some cases you see some studies that have very indirect markers of performance, perhaps some sort of, protein on a cellular level or things like that, uh, that I don't even understand. And I tend to skip those papers, <laughs> but can you go, can you go into uh, sort of how, uh, how valid papers are based on what outcome measures are used or sort of how practically applicable they are to, to us and what might actually uh, have an impact on the practical level as athletes? I think it, it, if we look at it on a spectrum, um, that's probably the best and, and most digestible way to look at it. If something is being measured on a cellular level, then we're not going to be doing that out in the field. From a practical self-coach or, or hiring a coach or having a conversation with a coach, that is not something you're going to measure. 
However, it could be critically meaningful and understanding what those changes were could better inform some of those practical decisions. Like I look at, at studies with mitochondria, you know, when we look at aerobic capacity, we can Im- increase the number of mitochondria, the size of the mitochondria, the efficiency of the mitochondria. So when we look at that, well, that's really important information. And if a particular training intervention or training level or training status can influence that or have them die or, or become less active. I want to know about that. Right. As a self-coached athlete, do I need to know about that? Me, Probably not. Cause you're not going to be doing it. But as a, as a coach of athletes, I probably better understand what my impact is doing to someone's structure along that spectrum. When we look at things like VO2 max changes or time to exhaustion changes or um, some of the other performance markers, those have to be looked at always with an eye to what it was. Somebody's time to exhaustion, exhaustion and fatigue are, are different from person to person and different on a daily basis and based on motivation and fueling and all sorts of other pieces. So what was the setup for that, those findings? And if it's a good setup, those become really more interesting findings to the real world athlete. Because if putting up a competitor on the screen, having a, you know, a, an avatar up on that screen to chase, well, that teaches you something. Wow. If I have an external point of view or external focus of, of attention or have a competitor, the social facilitation piece I'm going to be able to push myself harder than if I'm sitting in a dark room in the basement on the trainer, which is relevant to a lot of athletes who do a lot of their work alone. Um, And then the highest level of, of that spectrum from a generalizability to outside the lab standpoint is tests that were actually taken outside the lab. You know, did somebody actually go out and perform in a race or perform in an event? And what were those findings? The problems there then become, unless we have a picture of the entire training process up to that point, and it was controlled, we can't often say with any kind of level of confidence that it was this intervention that made the difference. Um, There was a, a study looking at London marathoners talking about the amount of carbohydrate ingested before the race and race performance people who ingested more carbohydrates in their pre-race meals had faster race performances. They didn't control any of the training or levels of experience. And they only measured one marathon that single day of that London marathon. And the idea that, wow, yeah, no, they actually have ran the marathon. That's really field applicable. That's really externally valid, generalizable, but Nothing was controlled. So we can't actually say it was the carbohydrates that made the difference. Yeah. yeah. So the, that, that's the pieces that I think it's always, it's always important to know the context. Yeah, absolutely. Great. And so, so with, with all of this, it, uh, it gives us an idea of uh, how diligent we need to be when, when it comes to really digging into the actual papers. And for me, I have to say, I learned something that was completely new to me. I'm somebody who very few papers do I read the entire paper. And what I tend to skip is always the introduction and your perspective on how important that is. That really opened up my eyes too. And and I totally agree with your perspective, but I've never thought of it that way. <laughs> so, so that will definitely change how, how I view research going forward. But uh, yeah, that's that's been for oh. me the thing that I skip. I go to the conclusion and then methods, results, that sort of thing. Uh, abstract first perhaps and, and title but uh, yeah that, that was really good information so 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 Excellent. on the on the flip side of that so so now we that's not to say that we we should uh, discard it just because it's not there are a lot of different different rabbit holes that we can fall into when it comes to to interpreting research but we know that there are a lot of complications here and uh, we need to perhaps uh, uh, be a bit reserved with with how we make or draw our conclusions for how it applies to us specifically but how can we use things like how, how do you use things like that lab testing for example that's something that that i think you do quite a lot to to make it more 
more applicable to the individual and also make sure that the individual athlete is progressing uh, as as you mean them to based on whatever training intervention you give them so lab testing i i mean it's it's the gold standard. It's the most accurate way we can understand the individual in front of us from a, a metabolic picture. Um, it's not the only way. It's, there's you know field testing and ongoing reading of people's training files and having actual conversations with people about how, how they're doing. That gives you pretty darn high level information as well. Uh, Cause you can't always get to somebody and do the lactate testing or put a mask on them and put a met, put them in, um, on a met cart. Um, can we do that? Yeah. Will it give us the best level of information possible to see where they're at right now and be able to compare that reliably and accurately in the future? Yeah. But we also have to understand that people live in the real world. So being able to do that field testing piece is critically important. Um, when we look at an athlete, if we are using averages and zones and most likelies, it, it, it's it's my sort of challenge with plans for races. You know that that sort of twenty four weeks to your best race kind of plan. My challenge with that is it's it's picking the average and it's coaching to the middle of what's most likely to happen. What are the basic needs of the race? What are the basic structures that get you there? And and if you follow these, you're, you're going to have a decent day, but could you have a better day if we knew more about you? You know, when we look at this idea of what makes up somebody's metabolic profile, some of us are going to be much higher in aerobic capacity some of us are going to be much higher in anaerobic capacity than others for that same sport. What's the crisscross there? And how do I affect that? That's really important. Laboratory measures are going to let us do that in the most accurate and precise way. It's going to give us the most narrow window for us to be accountable in. Field testing still gives us a window of accountability, but it's a bit broader window of accountability and no testing and no data collection and no metrics measurement at all gives us really no accountability. And, and for me, the higher somebody's goals are, the, the more narrow that window of accountability needs to be. So that's kind of a, a longer answer than the question you asked. <laughs> But do you need to measure something? Yeah. The more precise and accurate that measure is allows you to be more precise and accurate in the targeting of it. And it holds you accountable for change. And that's important. When, if you do field testing, if you don't go into a lab, what field tests do you recommend and how closely or or not closely at all do these tests uh, typically correspond to to the results that you might have in a lab test and i guess the, the really to to get specific how good is a 20 minute ftp test in terms of corresponding to for example your maximum lactate steady state uh, that you can can measure in a lab it's the first piece would be how well did the person do it <laughs> that would be the the sort of critical factor yeah. um how well does it correspond it corresponds pretty well for most people. What is different and harder to get a picture of in field testing is how did they accomplish that task? Was it a primarily aerobic task where they are drawing much more on that ability to, yeah, to kind of sit at that level and go hard enough to actually challenge it? The, the, I think the challenge that I face the most with the FTP test is the idea of 0.95. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, this, the, this is exactly what the, I'm getting at. <laughs> yeah, uh, that that's the piece that, you know, typically with a functional threshold power test, you take that number, you multiply it by 0.95, and you get somebody's FTP, somebody's functional threshold power. Um, will it work? Yeah, it will. But we don't know precisely what that is made up of. So for some people, their ability to sustain that type of wattage could be much higher than somebody else's. 
and it may not create as much damage or difficulty to recover from. Um, I'm, I'm kind of the, the perfect example of this. My FTP is not particularly high, um, but I can sustain a huge chunk of it forever. And if you ask me to go over, a, you know, more than 105% of it, I'd die like a dog. Yeah, you know, I I am an aerobic individual, and I've been doing endurance sports for <clears throat> a really long time. Um, so that 0.95 number is not the right value for me. Whereas I have other athletes who come from a, a more stochastic sports background where they're they're more on off, and they're the number that that 0.95 calculates. It's a great looking number. It's huge. It satisfies everybody's ego involved, but they can't sustain a high percentage of that for the type of racing that they want to do, or even a target percentage of that for the type of racing they want to do. So it's not a good number for them. And and that's the piece where you can't just do a 20 minute test. Like you have to do more. You have to understand what people can do for, you know, real short-term stuff, sort of short-term stuff for that 20 minutes. It's a good effort, but also what do they do consistently out on the road and what does it cost them physiologically as a result? So, you know, you give somebody a two hour ride and you want them riding at 75% or lower. Great. You, you get all the data, you have the conversation with them and you find out they're completely shattered by it. I was like, Okay, well, were you eating and drinking? Okay, great. Were you rested going in? Okay, great. So it just shattered you. Well, that tells us something more than any field test or or lab test is ever going to get to us because that person felt shattered by it, meaning the next time they go out and do it, one of two things is going to happen. They're they're either going to be really assertive and try and push that limit to to teach it a lesson kind of thing or they pull back just a little bit because it hurt them last time. So now it's going to hurt them again. And what it means for, for me as a coach or for the self-coach athlete is why did it hurt so much? Was it how you accomplished the task? Did you have to go too much into that glycolytic or that anaerobic side of things in order to do that? Well, that's more devastating than a two hour ride at 75% that's primarily aerobic based. I think that the idea of field testing is it can't just be testing. It has to be ongoing monitoring of how the, the values, the thresholds you've set are actually impacting the person in front of you. Yeah. yeah that makes a lot of sense. And if, if an athlete is to go and, uh, and do a lab test, are, are there some things, specific things that you could, that you would recommend that they do and just give us advice? Like, for example, do you recommend a, uh, getting a, a vo2 max test in a met card over just a lab normal lactate test and those sorts of things on a cycling test do you recommend using your own power meter in in that sort of setup on an indoor trainer or uh, are there any other uh, any, any advice that you you might give an athlete that might go and do a lab test the more you can make it about that person is 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 the better it's going to be um so for that lab test you know making sure they're rested hydrated prepared to have the test is step one. Um, Putting them in a good psychological mindset when they get there is step two. Putting them on their own equipment is really important because that sets up a picture of what it costs somebody to do the work they do when they're doing it on their stuff. Um, So having a person's own bike is really important. Bringing somebody's heart rate monitor in is really important setting them up with a second heart rate monitor just in case, not a bad idea. Uh, All of those things influence how something turns out. Um, So yeah, I, if, I mean, what we have set up, um, I coach the group called breakthrough performance coaching. We have finally a dedicated space where we keep the met cart and within that space, we have a treadmill and we have compu trainers. So we are able to have somebody bring in their bike, bring in what, you know, their stuff and do a test in an environment that we have, we have set up to be able to 
hopefully set them up for success. And the numbers you get from something like that can be very different than, uh, you know, on a erg bike riding at 50 RPMs at a steady state wattage, that's less precise to the person in front of you. When they get to self-select cadence, when they get to self-select what they consider their hard efforts, you get a picture of that person. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Going back a bit to the to the art side of, of coaching and training, let's talk a little bit more about that and, and how important it is. How, how do you apply it as a coach with your athletes? Can you just give us some examples of, of things that we cannot see from from the data and from and know from research about things that are super important when it comes to developing your athletes to to achieve their goals what can't we see from the data it depends it depends on how much your athletes actually give you comments because we, we got to keep remembering subjective information are data um people's comments are data so we get from that, a picture of certain things. But what can't we see? We can't see technique. We can't see efficiency. We can't see what was going on inside of their heads at any given moment in time. Um, and how that impacts somebody's performance is is critical. And because if, if someone is constantly holding themselves back, it doesn't matter how good their physiology is if they can't actually access it. So how do I do this. I, I mean, I coach a very small number of athletes, um, and I know who they are. We talk a lot about technique and efficiency. We look at speed, um, and how much that speed costs somebody in terms of power and our heart rate over time, not just single snapshots. And we talk and we, I, I start to understand who that person is and what, potential limiting factors are going on and we start to work on those. It's, it's, it's really interesting to see how different people approach the same type of training and what really fuels one person makes another person feel like they failed or, or um, didn't accomplish the task. So the next cascade off of that is this spiral away from consistency or a need to work harder to punish themselves for missing a target. Those are the pieces that the individual really matters. Um, you know, I have a couple of athletes right now, you know, one of whom has the physical capacity to do everything she wants to do. I knew it. I can see it. The numbers dictated it. Like there's no question from speed to power to heart rate to fuel ingestion to all of those pieces. But she didn't believe she could do it. And so that process of taking certain, taking a step-by-step -step approach to showing levels of success, it's, it's a longer term project than changing somebody's FTP, but it's a far more important project because it's it's rarely the body that holds the person back. It's it's more often than not what stress a person puts on themselves that interferes with the stress that we are trying to impose on their body to make those physiological changes. How how do you make a change there on that mental side and and the self belief that the athlete may lack? Pointing out where they're wrong in their conclusions, um, that idea of perspective, that idea of, of, you know, pulling them back off the ledge kind of thing, um, and teaching patience and self-regulation and reinforcing those pieces when they come up, having conversations about how to cope with the fact that, you know what? Yeah, you're going up a hill at four miles an hour and it stinks. There is nothing fun about going up a hill at four miles an hour. But you know what? If you beat yourself up doing it, it's really different than if you pick a point up the road, choose an external point of focus and just hit your cadence. So teaching a process mindset on a, on a regular basis or reinforcing a process mindset is, is the way to teach people or inform people or allow people to experience successes. And then you build on them. 
you know, if I just said, well, you went four miles an hour up that hill, well, (laughs) that was a crappy day. I've pretty much just destroyed anything good that could have come out of that day. And that's a problem. Um, So taking that same situation and being like, all right, you're going four miles up the hill. What was going on? Well, I couldn't get my legs over and, you know, it was just stupid and I wanted to quit and okay, great. So what are we going to do differently next time? How could that have gone better? If I just kept pedaling, I would have gotten up the hill. Yeah. Without beating yourself up. Okay, great. So how are we going to actually approach that next time? I don't know. All right. Well, let, let's choose a couple things that we're going to work on. Let's, yeah. And then picking a couple of triggers or a couple of targets for that and building those skills over time. It's just like accruing physiological change. It psychological skills develop with interventions and, and opportunities to practice them. For for the self coach athlete again that might not have a coach to gu- guide them down that path, what are one or two things that you think would be particularly important for them to work on on the psychological side that uh, that typically would would help an age grouper on average? Single best thing I would say is start practicing your reflections after every single training session using a format of good, better, how. The good, what went well in the session? Because something always did go well, always. We lose it sometimes in the sight of the stuff that doesn't, but something always went well. And if we can start to capture that efficacy, start to capture what went well, we don't feel quite so badly about ourselves, step one. Um, The next piece of that is what could have gone better that was in my control? Like, I can't control the weather. I can't control a, a, a bad driver. There's so many things I can't control. But I can control my effort. I can control my attitude. I can control my attentional focus. Um, I can control my fueling. And so from that, what one or two things could have gone better that were within my control? And then the final piece of that reflection uh, every time would be, how am I going to change it next time? What am I going to do differently next time? Well, you know what? I'm going to take a couple of deep breaths and reset my focus on the process, or I'm going to pack more snacks looking at things through the lens of good, better, and how sets up the next session and the session after that and the session after that from a position of success and a position of learning. And every time we learn, we get better. Yeah, I don't know if your experience is the same, but uh, from my conversations with my athletes and and the comments that they that they send after the workouts, uh, I think that m- more often than not, the the better piece of of workouts would be would typically be something along the lines of of improving the attitude to something that was outside of their control is that something that you experience as well i've had enough experience with a lot of my athletes that that's not the first place they go generally (laughs) but for newer athletes without question it's just like um you know i was up at montremblant uh this past fall doing the ironman there and we had a one hour delay on the beach and then this one was foggy. And then 62 miles into the bike ride, I had the most freakish mechanical incident I've ever had in a race. And I was by the side of the road for 35 minutes. And then I rode in a fixed gear for 27 miles and (laughs) the entire time, A, I couldn't believe that this was happening. And then B, I kept beating myself up about it. I kept, it was, I quit, I quit, I quit, I quit, I quit. Every pedal stroke, I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. It was exhausting. (laughs) And I look at that and it's like, you know what? I didn't do anything wrong. This, this freakish thing happened and I spent a good chunk of time paying the price for that. And I, I've been doing this for a really long time. It's, it's not, unnatural it's what we do but being able to reset and reshift or continue moving through it is the experience we want to make sure we get people um but yeah no people can people can blame the world in it and yeah, it's real yeah. uh, one one question going back a little bit to, to our previous discussion this is more so related to the training and uh, the testing etc but uh, i'm curious how do you prescribe swim bike and run workouts in terms of uh, do you use uh, 
rate of perceived exertion or heart rate or power or pace or does it depend on the athlete and and also what uh, zone system if any do you prefer to use because there are a lot of them out there <laughs> uh it's i'm gonna start with this, the second part the the zone system i prefer to use i mean we need some type of threshold I, we need to be able to have a conversation with folks that's meaningful and carries over from place to place. We need something. Um, I've come more and more to liking the, the zones that trainer road uses. Um, you know, that idea of endurance, tempo, sweet spot, threshold, super threshold, they're clear, they're simple. They allow a window of trainability for the type of busy athletes that, that we're working with. And I've, I've started actually because people spend so much time on the bike, they have a really good understanding of what that an effort feels like when it's an endurance effort versus a sweet spot effort. And, and I've started to capitalize on that a bit more, particularly in the run. In the swim, um, because it's so much of a technique dependent sport, I, I think the conversations are a little bit different uh, because there we need to make sure there's an opportunity to practice technique. And that has to have its own effort levels with it because the effort comes from the focus and the intention as opposed to the work. And then being able to sustain that technique at a, at, at a target pace, that's a different level of work as well. So there I tend to go with, you know, steady, fastest, repeatable, and, you know, fast in all capital letters kind of thing. And then as we get closer and closer to a race, that becomes more about pacing and what the numbers are around the pacing for that target event. Um, so within that, how do I prescribe to athletes? It depends. It depends on who that person is and what that time of year is. The systematic setup of this training session is the same for everybody. Um, everybody gets a picture of something that, is addressing, you know, a, a specific physiological goal and how that is communicated to the athlete is really dependent on how that person resonates with work. Is somebody really numbers oriented and, and wants to hit targets? Well, then we talk about what the range that I want to see is. It's never a precise target. It's always a range because days are different. Um, and then for somebody who's a, a more art side, a more emotionally driven athlete, what's that going to feel like? I want you to feel like you're working at an, you know, at an indoor time trial for that four minute block. I want you to feel like you are in a parade. I want it to be that easy and creating the analogy for them. Um, so all of that, it depends for everybody though. I'm looking at the picture of, what was the actual work they actually did? What type of zone does it fall into? So what was the physiological challenge of it? How did they handle it? What was the physiological cost? So heart rate, perceived exertion, and then what was their reflection on it? Did it take a ton out of them or was it, was it something that served them well at the given time? And on, on the bike, if you're using power, uh, do you always prescribe to power or do you perhaps prescribe to heart rate for certain types of sessions? And similarly on the run, if you use pace and heart rate, it, what's the hierarchy for you in, in different types of session with, with the measures of intensity there? I will almost never prescribe a heart rate. I will choose, a, I will prescribe a power. I will prescribe a pace a ceiling or a pace floor. I want, I want to make sure you're going faster than this for that particular effort, or I want to make sure you're faster than this for a particular effort. Um, heart rate is, heart rate is to me most valuable over time as opposed to in any single given session, unless I know somebody is the type of person who's going to go out and do an active recovery or endurance piece too hard. Uh, and for that, what I'll do is I'll set a heart rate ceiling based on percentage of threshold. Yeah. You know, I, if you're going higher than this, yeah, you're going too hard, settle it down and, and just check the ego at the door and just ride under this. Got it. Uh, great. And this is a question that comes in a lot. So, so it's a uh, great to hear your opinion, opinion on this as well. 
Um, finally, I didn't prepare you for these questions, but they I just um, they just came to mind uh, because two more topics are perhaps the most uh, the most commonly asked these days uh, to me at least in my email inbox, and those are uh, nutrition, various nutritional um, diets like LCHF, and then the concept of polarized training. And uh, since you're somebody who who knows the research and can interpret it very well. I just wanted to pick your brains and ask you what your opinion on these things is. If we first, for example, talk about, talk about polarized training just a little bit, what do you think about that? Polarized training has a place. I mean, Steven Seiler's work demonstrates that it is efficient and effective for certain types of athletes. And it, it's got to be a tool in the toolbox. And is it appropriate for everybody? No. Is it appropriate for every type of event or preparation? Also, no. Um, but I absolutely think that there is a place for it in the toolbox. Um, it is, it's a really effective process for certain people and certain types of athletes. And, and some people really love it, which is, a, is something we don't talk about enough. But if you like it, you're going to do it. And if you're consistently doing something, you're going to improve. So, so I think that that's really cool. But it is it you always have to be keeping an eye on who's the person in front of you, what's the race target, what's the primary goal, what do they need, and is this going to get them there? And then what kind of time do they have available to do that? So, so you know, it's it's always the moving part. Do, do you think there is a do you think there is a minimum time threshold? Or uh, l- let me reframe this because we don't really know this. I, I know, but at what weekly volume in terms of hours per week of training do you think it uh, it typically would not make any sense to to go down that uh, that road with with polarized training? I can't answer that. I, I don't know. I would have to look okay. a whole lot more at the research in terms of that. And I would have to look a whole lot more at the athletes in front of me um, to see what it is they're capable of handling, what the rest of their world looks like, um, what their ability to recover is. Uh, although there's, there's too many, I feel like there's too many, there's too many pieces in that question that can come back to bite me in the butt later on. If I <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No problem. And 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 then uh, a LCHF or ketogenic diets. Uh, what's uh, your take on that? And for for endurance athletes specifically, it's going to again come back to the person and what they can sustain and what works for them. Um, people have had success on every different type of diet system that's out there. People have also had failures on every t- type of system that's out there. In my experience, if someone's not faced with a, a, you know, health or metabolic crisis, if you can eat regularly well and nutritionally dense and meet your fueling needs and can sustain that day in and day out, and you've got enough energy for training and you've got enough energy for life and you've got enough energy for, for rebuilding the structures you need, then, then that's going to work for you better than any single system. Um, for some folks, they've had so many failures and they're metabolically in need that they can adhere to a diet like LCHF and really thrive on it. And to the other extreme of things, if you take away my carbohydrates, I fall apart. I need those carbohydrates and it's not from a lack of training or, or maybe it is, but mentally, psychologically, and physically, I perform better when I have that carbohydrate load in my diet. I think anytime we say one size fits all, we're wrong. And I think anytime we say, you know, one thing is all bad, we're wearing blinders. There's, Everything has a cost and a benefit. And from a fueling standpoint, the primary goal of fueling has to be physical health. And if you are not meeting your needs to sustain physical health in the lifestyle that you're living, it's not the right lifestyle and it's not the right diet for you. Um, We got to eat. We got to eat food. 
we got to function. And if what we're eating isn't helping us function, we need to examine it better. Yeah. Okay. Great answer. So this has been a long interview, but uh, we're finally wrapping it up with rapid fire questions. But before, just before that, is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you that you want to mention related to this to this topic or these topics that we discussed today? Honestly, I think the biggest thing I would say is remember that that we're all doing this for fun. Like even if it's our careers, it's still got to be enjoyable. I think this is fun. And and looking at all of this from a way that brings you joy has got to be the end result. It has to be. Otherwise, you're not in it for the long term. It's too stressful that way. Yeah, that is brilliant. So the rapid fire questions uh, take 15 seconds or less to answer these. And the first question is, what's your favorite book, blog, or resource related to triathlon? For me, it's Google Scholar. I can type anything I'm interested in and I can go down a rabbit hole for hours and I can learn all sorts of things as I go. I I just think it's the coolest thing ever, particularly since my first round of college, I had to go to the library and go through a card catalog and find resources to have all of that knowledge at your fingertips with the ability to interpret it and learn it. It's it's a gift. Yeah, it's fantastic. And uh, what's a personal habit that's helped you achieve success? Uh, my, my funny answer was like the first thing I thought of was I don't pick my nose in public. So, you know, that's a good thing. Um, but the reality is, is I'm stubborn. Um, I, I want to understand something and getting roadblocked on it isn't going to stop me from learning it. I'll, I'll keep persisting. And what do you wish you had known or done differently at some point in your career? <sighs> Big answer. I, you can't train everything. Sometimes there's actually a reason it's not changing. And that should be something that should be part of people's toolbox too. Um, quick answer. I, it turns out I have a ton of food allergies and dye allergies and all, all sorts of sensitivities. So I, I was never successful at long course racing because I would always have issues around throwing up and breathing issues. And it, it always came back to this idea that it's me. I had to train my gut. I had to, to change what I was doing, but it never, it, it took a really long time to get to the idea that it was allergies. You can't train an allergy. Mm. So you can't train everything. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Susan, finally tell the listeners where they can find out more about you, your coaching, uh, perhaps your, your research papers. If you have a, a profile where you have those, uh, all these sorts of things where the listeners can follow you. Uh, So the coaching group I work with is BreakthroughPerformanceCoaching.com. My personal email is Susan at BreakthroughPerformanceCoaching.com. Research papers, I am mostly a second or third author on papers. Um, I have found out that prioritizing my research agenda was not as good and valuable to me as helping my students prioritize their research agendas. Um, But if you search Susan Sotir on Google Scholar, a few things will pop up there. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Susan. It was a real pleasure having you on. Michael, thank you so much. All right. I really hope that you enjoyed that interview. Uh, My main takeaways are, I have quite a long list of them, actually, a really long list here now that I look through it. And I talked about this before, but it bears repeating that uh, just because my website is called Scientific Triathlon, it does not mean that I think that science is any more important than than art when it comes to coaching. Really, it was just a domain that was available, and I do like science, and I think it's important, but it's not any more important than the art. Both are equally important. It's like saying, would you rather chop off your left or your right leg? Well, I'd rather have both, please. <laughs> so, uh, so, so don't take the fact that, uh, that the website is called Scientific Triathlon and that's the brand name uh, as uh, meaning that I don't think that the art is just as important and, and super important when it comes to, to coaching. Uh, it, it was uh, more of a spur of a moment, to be honest, when I bought the domain name. I do talk about this uh, at length in episode 109, which I'll link to. It's called uh, Science to Practice. And uh, it's about science and how to how to apply it in practice, but also how important other things like the athlete's experience and the coach's experience are when it comes to, to optimizing how you train and get the most out of your training. Uh, if you are a coached athlete, then uh, the most important data that uh, your coach can ever get from you are 
your post-workout comments, your general communication about how you're feeling, uh, your subjective feedback, nothing beats that. It doesn't matter what your power meter, your heart rate, your pace says. Uh, your your subjective feedback is the most important data that your coach will get. And I think that most coaches would agree with that. If you think about it, this is how athletes managed to get really great back in the day, uh, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Of course, the triathlon wasn't around like back in the 50s, for example. But endurance athletes managed to get become really, really great, even by today's st- standards in some cases. And uh, and that's because they had they communicated with their coaches. They did not have any uh, data other than stopwatches, which they used, of course, if they were runners and went to the track running. But a lot of it was just that subjective feedback, and and that is like so important. So do not undervalue this. Another thing that I wrote down as a takeaway is that I've definitely been guilty in the past of using the term data driven. Uh, even though I've always considered the subjective feedback to be like the comments after workouts, that's still data, as we talked about. Uh, despite this, I think that data-driven is not a good term. Uh, so I decided to stop using that, even though sometimes I catch myself still doing it. But that's uh, that's uh, my intention, at least, to stop using that and rather consider training. It should be data-informed, but not data-driven. And this, again, comes back to the fact that the art piece is equally important and things like facial expressions tone of voice when when i talk with my athletes uh, those are like in in addition to the things that they actually say but the the ways that the athletes say it and uh, and even in the comments like sometimes you can read things between the lines based on how they're writing these are all things that uh, that i need to take into account in my coaching and i do take into account in my in my coaching uh, so that's why, yeah, uh, the term data-driven, I've tried to stop using that because it doesn't make sense, because it's it's one important input to the performance puzzle, but it's uh, not the only one. Uh, there are there are these other things, the the art side, <laughs> again, coming back to that, that, that comes into play, definitely. And, and that's, again, that's another reason why a long-term coach-athlete relationship is, is so valuable, that the longer you go on with a coach, the more he or she gets to know you and uh, the better that relationship becomes the the more it keeps on giving because that art piece grows stronger and stronger and stronger all the time then the next takeaway is that if you are interested in reading scientific papers definitely do go back and listen to how susan described that you should go about doing that it was absolutely brilliant and for me actually like what she mentioned about the importance of the introduction that was kind of eye-opening because the way that i've I, I I tend to quite often skip over that introduction, uh, to be totally honest. Susan made some great arguments for why you should read that to get to complete context and potential biases as well. Uh, I've always done uh, done it in the order of like reading the abstract, then the conclusion, then the methods, then the results, and then the introduction only if I have time. But I'll definitely be more diligent with with getting the context by reading the introduction earlier in the process going forward. And just as an additional personal note for how to learn what the science says before you read the latest papers is to, that you need to get a very good knowledge of the current state of the art, the overall um, knowledge existing in, in any given field by reading meta-analysis and systematic reviews and textbooks uh, before you, you try to apply knowledge from one single paper, one single research study. So, so a couple of great textbooks like my number one recommended resource now is Endurance Training, Science and Practice by Inigo Mujica. This is a true textbook that uh, could be used in universities. I don't know if it is, but it could be. Inigo Mujica is uh, one of the world's leading endurance sports scientists and coaches. And he has collected chapters from the world leading experts in in their respective fields in this book. So, so that's fantastic. For more like popular science books that are slightly easier reads but less comprehensive than endurance training also a lot cheaper like in the 30 euro range rather than 150 euro range you can look at triathlon science and cycling science they are very good but not as comprehensive as endurance training and uh, another textbook uh, just about uh, nutrition is endurance sports nutrition by asker jokendrup uh, so if you are a coach or you are an athlete that want to still stay self-coached, then these, these are the kind of investments that, that I think you, you just have to make if you're serious about improving. 
All right, so that's about it for the takeaways. Uh, of course, you can find the show notes on thattriathlonshow.com and leave any comments or questions there. Now, as I mentioned, I just launched my new intermediate Ironman plan. So as much as I am a proponent of individual coaching and the individuality of training, uh, there I know that for many, it's just not a feasibility to have a coach. It uh, The investment is too much for them because it does cost a lot of money if you want to, to have a good coach. So I do think that generic training plans have a very important role to play. Uh, but us as training plan creators, we have the responsibility to make sure that we allow you, the user, to execute the plan as intended and also to adapt it to your individual situation. And that's what I try to do with my training plans. And I continue on the same theme as the intermediate half distance plan. That was the last plan that I launched by including a lot of coaching videos, like one for each week, plus a big introduction, like overall general coaching video to make sure that you 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 learn all of these things and you understand all of these uh, these adaptions that you, you might need to make to your program and understand what is important in the program. Everything is important, of course, but uh, but uh, the priorities of workouts and, and things like that. So, so these are things that are included that I don't think are included in a lot of generic training pl- programs. So, so I would say that this plan is one that it is a generic plan at, uh, at its core, but it's one that is meant to be individualized by you for you. So that's the idea. Uh, it's uh, now if you go to the the cold hard facts about it it's 20 weeks long on average it has 11 hours of training per week Uh, you have the coaching videos that i already mentioned one per week plus one introductory video Uh, it's based on we have three different versions so one is uh, running pace bike power one is running pace bike heart rate and one is running power bike power so you can choose between those and uh, it's only available on training peaks right now but pdfs will become available within a month or so and those will be included if you buy free training peaks right now uh, so choose the right version on training peaks there to get that i'll link to them in the show notes and the episode description of course uh, the price is until the 10th of february it's 30 us dollars and then it will go back to the regular price of 75 us dollars so so that's with the coupon code 60 uh, 60 you get a 60 percent discount from 75 us dollars to 30 us dollars again that's valid only until the t- 10th of february so so it's time to time to get that plan now in the next episode i talk with uh, legend of the sport barb lindquist and we have a great uh, chat on training racing elite and age group athletes so it's a varied conversation but very very useful barb lindquist of course is uh, uh, the person she was ranked number one in the world in 2004 2005 and she's also the person behind the famous usat collegiate recruitment program that was uh, that brought for example gwen jorgensen into the into the sport before we end this episode big thanks to precision hydration for sponsoring this episode Uh, one aspect of my training that i'm really working on hard right now is to balance low and high intensity days and that means that my high intensity days typically have at least they have two high intensity workouts plus maybe gym sometimes so that my low intensity days can be completely low intensity Uh, so so if i have a hard run and then a hard swim later on in the day and probably only with a few hours of rest in between them then i find more and more that my hydration and rehydration with precision hydration between those sessions that really is critical for my performance in the second session of the day it it helps a lot when i really focus on that on rehydrating immediately after the first hard session then i can go out and perform in that second hard session as well so it's something i haven't paid much more attention to in the past but i'm very aware of now and will be going forward so i keep learning stuff all the time just wanted to to bring that out there in case this is something that might apply to you of course, no matter what your use case is for Precision Hydration Electrolyte products, you can get your first box for free on precisionhydration.com with the promo code that triathlon show, all one word, all caps. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon.